Chapter 10. Rotation of a rigid object about a fixed axis. So far, we spent a few chapters studying the kinematics and dynamics of a system which is basically a point mass. Of course, we know in real life we don't have point masses. Every object has shape and size. Just that under certain circumstances, the shape and size are not very important because they do not affect the outcome significantly. For example, if I look at a box sliding on a table, no matter how big that box is, as long as the box keeps on only sliding instead of tumbling over, then I can find various points on that box. For example, here is a red point. It moves forward from here to there. This is the displacement vector for the red point. And then I have a green point which meanwhile does the exact same thing, has the exact same displacement, and this blue point also has the same exact displacement. So you see, in this particular case, when the thing is sliding, we say it's doing translational motion along the x direction. Every point in that box, no matter how big it is, has exactly the same displacement. And therefore, I can think of the box as just a point, or in other words, a particle, because I'm studying only its translational motion. This is a case where the shape and size of the box hardly matter. On the other hand, we can also look at the case where the box starts to rotate. Say it rotates about this point. Now, you look at these three representative points, the red one, the green one, and the blue one. They now behave very differently. You know, the red one goes from here to there. It moves on an arc like this. And the green one does a different arc motion. And this uh, blue one does something yet totally different. So now we have a situation where these points have different kind of movement. And therefore, we cannot just think of the entire object as just a point anymore, because various portions of that object now have different kinds of movement. Right? So in this case, we have to look at this problem from a different angle. And that is, we must take into consideration the shape and size. As a matter of fact, that often happens, that the shape and size can influence the outcome. For example, if you have a solid sphere and a hollow one, okay, you can raise them down an incline. Suppose they both roll down without slipping down an incline. The solid one and the hollow one will not reach the bottom at the same time. Even if I give them the same radius and same mass, they will still not reach the bottom at the same time. It turns out that the solid one always wins. It always reaches the bottom the first. In this case, the uh, shape and the size matters. In fact, where the mass is distributed also matters. Therefore, when we look at problems like that, we must take into consideration the shape and size. In other words, we're going away from simply a point mass or a particle point mass. We're now looking at an extended object. So we're doing something more sophisticated. What's the difference between the extended object and the point? Well, for an extended object, not only can it move from place to place, that's called translational motion, but in addition to that, it can also have rotation, right? It can also have rotation. I mean, it's meaningless to talk about a point rotating about itself, but it is meaningful to talk about an extended object rotating about a certain point. So we are now going to focus on the rotation of an object now that we have to consider an extended object with finite shape and size. So we're going to study rotation. But we're going to study the simplest type of rotation first. First of all, when you have rotation, you're rotating about certain axis, right? And when the axis itself can be moving, the situation can be pretty complicated. As a matter of fact, I will show you this little demonstration and you will see what I mean. Okay, so here I have a little demonstration for you. Suppose I have this little box and I want to rotate this box. And suppose I change the axis of rotation. I have two rotations. I'm going to move, I'm rotated first forward and then to the left. Okay, so remember, forward and then left. This is what, what it looks like. Forward and left. So it ends up like this. Okay, it ends up like, like this. Again, I start from this position forward and left. It ends up like this. Now, suppose I start from the same position, but this time I'm going to reverse the order of these two rotations instead of forward and left. I'm going to go left and forward. And now let's see what happens. Left and forward. You see, 
it now lies on the table. The final result is totally different. The only difference was I have two rotations, but I exchanged the order in the second trial. Okay, so what did that tell us? It tells us that when it comes to rotation, if you change the axis of rotation, then the funny thing is that the order matters. Okay, in other words, if you have two rotations, A and B, the, the result of A plus B and the result of B plus A are generally not the same. Unless, of course, it rotates about the same axis, so you start from here, right? You say, I'm going to ro rotate 90 degrees and 45 degrees. Or, if I go 45 degrees and 90 degrees, then it wouldn't matter because I'm rotating about the same axis. So you see, when you shift the axis, the thing can be complicated, and therefore, I'm going to fix the axis of rotation. Therefore, it's the rotation about a fixed axis. Okay. Secondly, we have an extended object, right? So the shape and size now become something I need to consider. But I want the thing to have a fixed shape and size. In other words, I want the object to be rigid. Because if the object change its shape and size, once again, you can see the situation can be more complicated. In fact, in the next chapter, we're going to look at what happens when we do allow the shape to change in the middle of the rotation. But for now, from, from now, we want to make things really simple. So we're considering an object with finite shape and size, but these shape and size cannot change, so it's a rigid object, okay? And it rotates, we do allow it to rotate, but we do not allow the axis of rotation to change, so it's rotation about a fixed axis. Just like what we did for particle, we're now going to do study the dynamics, and first of all, study the kinematics, and then we study the dynamics of rotation. Uh, first of all, kinematics. You know, in kinematics, we describe motion. In this case, we're going to describe rotation. I have here a rigid object. It is rigid, so what does that tell us? Well, suppose I have an axis right here, sticking out of the paper, perpendicular to the paper. Okay, so this point passed through the axis. Now, suppose I look at a point I, an arbitrary point I, on this rigid object, and I draw a line from the axis of rotation to that point. This is the red line. Here is the initial point I, initial position of that point. After rotating a certain, through a certain angle, ends up at the final position F. The angle covered is delta theta. It is a rigid object, so what can I say about the rotation? Well, if it's a rigid object, then Every object, every point on that object, that is, has to rotate by the same exact amount. For example, if I have a point originally here, then I can draw a line, of course, connecting the uh, initial position and the axis of rotation. If that point went through an angle delta theta, then this green point would do the exact same thing. It's going to go through the exact same angle. In other words, this angle is also delta theta, okay? So, you know, the green point will, uh, will go through an arc like this. It is a smaller radius, so this distance is less than that distance, but the angle covered is the same. So you see, these two points, if you look at their linear displacement, it's totally different. This guy went from here to there, that one went from here to there. They have totally different orientation and totally different magnitude when it comes to linear displacement delta r. But they do go through the same angle because the whole object is rigid. Okay? If this guy moves through a small angle, then that one is going to lag behind. And the shape will then change. So you see, it is far more convenient when it comes to studying the rotation instead of using the linear movement, linear displacement of every particle, it is far more convenient for me to focus on the angle of rotation, because that is the same for all objects, for all points on a rigid object. So, let us look at delta theta. See how we can do that. That's one thing we, we, we want to do. We want to find out what's the angle of rotation, through which it, 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 rotation takes place. Another thing, of course, I want to know how fast rotation takes place, right? How fast rotation takes place. Uh, if the point went from, this point went from here to there, covered an angle delta theta, and that happened over time delta t, then I can define delta theta over delta t. That is the rate at which the angle of rotation changes. In other words, that's how fast the angle, the, 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 the angle increase or decrease. This 
is called the angular speed. We call it omega. We frequently use Greek letters instead of Latin letters when it comes to rotation. Okay, so we know how much angle has it has turned. We know how fast it turns on average. By the way, this is just the average value of omega. If you want instantaneous value, just like we did in uh, particle kinematics, we have to take delta t to be zero, approach zero. So omega is defined as the limit when delta t approaches zero, delta theta over delta t, of course. And that, as you know, is d theta dt. Okay. We know how much angle is turned, we know how fast it moves, how fast it rotates. What, what's the next thing we want to know? Well, as it turns, does it speed up or does it slow down? In other words, what is the angular acceleration? You know, linear acceleration is the rate out at which velocity changes. And angular acceleration, correspondingly, is the rate at which angular velocity changes. In other words, how fast does omega change? So, I'm going to introduce d omega dt. That is the instantaneous value of the angular acceleration. Instead of a, I use the letter alpha to denote it. So that's how alpha is defined. Now, since omega itself is the first derivative of theta, then this will become the second derivative of theta with respect to time. So these are the definitions. I have delta theta. That's the uh, that's the angle turned. If I take a derivative with respect to time d dt, what do I get? I get uh, omega, right? I take another d dt, what do I get? I get alpha. Okay, it's very much like what happens in, in, in linear motion. I start with displacement x, take a derivative with respect to time, I get v, take another derivative with respect to time, I get a. Okay, so I have delta x, right? If it's a linear movement d dt, I get v another ddt, and I get a. Look at the analogy here. As a matter of fact, we are going to exploit this analogy, the analogy between the kinematics of the fixed axis rotation and one-dimensional translational motion. Now, why do we focus on one-dimensional translation motion as an analogy? Because you know the thing about one-dimensional translation motion, it only takes one number to, to specify where that particle is, right? And that number is the x-coordinate of that particle, okay? If we know that as a function of time, then we take a derivative, we get v, another one, we get a, and so forth. In a fixed axis rotation, the x itself does not move, and it's also a rigid body. Therefore, every point goes through the exact same angular movement, okay? So how do you specify the amount of rotation? Well. Just like one-dimensional translational motion, I need only one number, and that is delta theta. Every point goes through the same exact angle, delta theta. Okay, so delta theta replaces delta x. And in fact, I can choose a reference line. Let's say I choose this reference line to be where theta equals zero. Okay, so I can have an initial angle, and I can have the final angle. The difference, of course, is delta theta. And with that reference line, I know where theta is equal to zero, just like in a one-dimensional Translation motion case, I have the x-axis and I have an origin, zero point. Once I have the origin, then I can figure out where that particle is in terms of the uh, coordinate, x. Just like here, the position of this rigid body is denoted with the angle theta. So a single variable, theta, specifies the configuration of the, uh, of the object. Where has it rotated to? It, re it replaces the uh, coordinate x. So you see, I have an analogy between fixed axis rotation and one-dimensional translational motion. Okay, I'm going to explore this analogy to the best I can. Therefore, if I know some formulas, which I already, of course, I know a lot about one-dimensional translation, right? Everybody knows a lot by, by then. I can, I can sort of use that analogy to figure out some formulas for the fixed axis rotation. In other words, I don't have to reinvent the wheels all the time. I can borrow some of the formulas, change the notations, then we can go from translation to rotation. So let's see how we can do that. How we can do that. First of all, I have here for translational motion, 1D translational motion. Here is fixed axis rotation. Okay, rotation. So I have x. What's the corresponding quantity? theta. Okay, and then I have v. 
which is dx dt. What's the corresponding quantity? Oh, that's omega, isn't it? That's d theta dt. You see, you see the analogy here? Okay, next I have a, which is dv dt. Similarly, I have alpha, which is d omega dt. Right? Now, in one dimensional motion, I looked at some special case. The special case that we studied, we focused on, was if A was a constant. Okay, so if A equals a constant. So what we have is called uniformly accelerated motion, right? Uniformly accelerated motion. Now, if A was a constant, you know there were several formulas that we derived before, way back in chapter 2. Okay, let me write down these formulas to refresh your memory. See if you can translate from the language of translational motion to the language of rotational motion so that I can instantly get corresponding formulas without going through all the derivations from scratch. Okay, so first of all, I have, uh, you know, uh, V equals V initial plus AT. Remember that? Okay, then I have X equals X initial plus V initial T plus one half A T squared. I also have a commonly used formula V final squared minus V initial squared equals 2A delta X. Of course, there are more formulas, but these are three of the most used, widely used formulas in fixed, in one-dimensional uh, one uniform accelerated motion. Now, can I get corresponding formulas for fixed axis rotation? Okay, for A equals a constant, I have a corresponding thing. I replace A with what? A with alpha. So if alpha is a constant. So in other words, the rotation does change its speed. Okay, it does change omega, but it changes omega at a uniform rate. Okay, so it rotates gradually, picks up speed, go faster and faster and faster at a uniform rate, or slower, 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 also at a uniform rate. Okay, here it says v equals v initial plus at. V is replaced by omega. V initial, of course, becomes initial value of omega. So that's omega initial. A is replaced by alpha. And therefore, the corresponding formula, as you can see here, would be omega equals omega initial plus alpha t. Okay, what is the meaning of this formula? This formula means that if you start from initial value at t equal to zero, if you're already rotating at this angular velocity, omega initial, and if the, if the angular acceleration alpha is a constant, then at time t later, you will be rotating at the current value of angular velocity, which is equal to omega initial plus alpha t. That's what it means. Next, let's look at this displacement formula. x equals x initial plus v initial t plus 1 half a t squared. How do you translate it to the language of rotation? Well, again, x is replaced by theta. So I have, I have theta equals theta initial plus v initial t becomes omega initial t, right? Omega initial t. What's the next term? One half what? Yes, alpha t squared. What is the meaning of this formula? It means that if at t equal to zero, you find that the position, the, uh, the angle the, from the reference line is theta initial. And also at this moment, t equal to zero, it is already rotating at initial angular velocity of omega initial. Then as long as the angular acceleration alpha is a constant, then at time t later, the uh, object would have rotated to a new angle, theta, which is given by this. Okay, finally, the last formula, v final squared minus v initial squared equals 2a delta x, can be translated as follows. Omega final squared minus omega initial squared equals what? 2 alpha delta what? Theta, of course. So what's the meaning of this formula? It says that if you look at the uniformly accelerated rotation, okay, then you start with this initial angular velocity. Undergoing this angular acceleration alpha, then after you turned an angle delta theta, that is your final angular velocity. Okay, so you see, by looking at the analogy, we are able to obtain these formulas just by look, looking at how we find corresponding quantities, we didn't really have to derive them from scratch. These are useful formulas for kinematics of fixed axis rotation.